Hello everyone. Uh, we are on page 241 in your binder. So if you get out page 241, uh, we are on chapter 21, which is the evolution of populations. So the last unit was just more of a broad overview of what evolution is and what evidences we have to support it. And this unit is three is another three chapters it's just going to talk about some of those um a little it just more detail you'll see what i'm talking about just a little bit more detail about a little bit of math that goes into it um what it actually means to be a species and stuff like that so for this lecture and for this video i am only going to go up to 20 minutes i don't know exactly what the stopping point is going to be for that but once i get around 20 minutes i'm going to go ahead and stop and then we will pick it up the next time um, you have class so on page 241 we're going to talk about microevolution microevolution as opposed to macro. And so you guys know what the, the prefix micro and macro means. Micro means at, at a really small level, okay? So it's a change in allele frequencies of a population over generations. And so the key word here is population. So we're not talking about an entire species. We're talking about just a group of the same species that live in the same area and breed with each other, all right? So that's what micro means. Um, it's important to know just a little bit of background information that Darwin um, came before Mendel. And even though he came up with a really great, um, the, the definition of natural selection and the theory of natural selection, um, he did not know exactly how traits were passed down to offspring. And then Mendel came and kind of completed his, uh, Darwin's idea of natural selection. So Mendel said something very, very important um, that kind of was tacked on to Darwin's theory in that evolution is based on genetic variation. So you're going to want to write the words genetic variation in that blank. All right. So how do we get genetic variation? Up to this point, we have talked about it multiple times, and I list them out for you verbally multiple times because it is so important, and College Board really likes to ask questions on it. So the five sources of genetic variation, you're like, wait, I thought there were Four. Uh, there's a lot of blanks to fill in, so let's just go through the list. Mutations are a source of genetic variation. All right, point mutations. Changes in one base of DNA. Chromosomal mutations. So up to this point, we had listed mutations as just one, but on this list, it's, it's differentiating between small-scale mutations and large-scale mutations. There's still mutations, all right? Um, point mutations are not as serious as chromosomal mutations. Chromosomal mutations are usually harmful, but as we learned with the ice fish um, that you saw a video on, even like large scale chromosomal mutations could potentially lead to something that's beneficial, although most of the time it doesn't. Sexual recombination. Sexual recombination is that random fertilization, independent assortment and crossing over. So all three of these. So before we would have said mutations, crossing over, independent assortment, random fertilization. But we just um, listed two types of mutations here. So this is the same thing we've been saying this whole time. So go ahead and pause if you need to write that down because I'm clicking. All right. Um, what are population genetics? So I said that we're talking about microevolution, and that's the evolution of a population. So the change in genetics within one population. And it is the study of how populations change genetically over time. And the definition for a population, so on your notes it says how do you define a population? They are a group of individuals that live in the same area and interbreed producing fertile offspring. So basically what I have given you right here in the definition of population is also the definition of species. So why is it that lions are considered one species and tigers are considered another species? But if a human took a tiger and a lion and like, I guess forced them, not really forced them to mate. I think they do like an artificial like insemination type deal. And then a liger can um, result. And ligers are fertile. 
So why is it that those are two different species? And even if they lived in the same area, they would be considered two different populations. It's because in nature, they do not breed together. So tiger, if they, if tigers and lions were around each other in the same area, they wouldn't be considered the same population, even though there is the potential for them to breed and have fertile offspring. So anyway, that is the definition of population. Um, and we're going to talk a lot more about um, the definition of species. It, in my definition of tigers and lions, it would be unlikely that they would even be in the same place because they live in, live in completely different habitats. But I'm just using that as an example off the top of my head. Um, but we'll go over some of those definitions a little bit more later. All right, a few more vocabulary words. Uh, what do we study when we look at population genetics? We study uh, gene pools, all of the alleles for all genes in all the members of that population. So if I'm talking about a population of tigers, I'm talking about the gene pool of just that population. All right, a diploid species is one that has two alleles for a gene, homozygous, heterozygous. So humans, we would be a diploid species. We have two alleles for a gene, one from mom, one from dad. So really any sexually reproducing species is a diploid species. Okay. A fixed allele means all the members of a population have only one allele for a particular trait. Meaning there aren't there for that one gene, let's say fur color. So let's say there is a certain fur color for a mammal living in the Arctic. Let's say it's white. Of that species, there is not the possibility of the fur to be brown. There is only a white fur allele for fur color. That would be a fixed allele. And the more fixed alleles a population has, the lower the species diversity. That makes sense. I mean, if you have a certain type of like mice, mouse, and you have an allele for white fur color, an allele for brown, an allele for black fur color, then you have a, a, a variation, right? And you have diversity. So if the environment changes, nature can select for whichever fur color is best suited to survive. But if it was a fixed allele and all mice were white, that isn't really a good thing because that lowers their diversity and it lowers the chance that there would be a potential for survival for that species if white all of a sudden became a bad color to be if the environment changed. Hopefully that made sense. All right, now we're gonna talk about the Hardy-Weinberg principle. The Hardy-Weinberg principle means is the, the allele and genotype frequencies of a population will remain constant from generation to generation. That is the principle. It never is actually true, and I think that's what's so confusing, is that there is never a time where the genotype frequencies of a population is going to remain constant from generation to generation. But this is like a comparison. It's like a standard to compare how much is something evolving. If Hardy-Weinberg principle states it is evolving not at all, then we can kind of see the degree to which something is evolving if we're comparing it to the Hardy-Weinberg principle. And so it's saying that um, these things remain constant from generation to generation unless they are acted upon by forces other than Mendelian segregation and the recombination of alleles. And so what we say is that we are in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium if the allele and genotype frequencies remain constant. And so what could be, what could be a force that causes a population to not be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? Well, we have these five things on the next page, page 242. There's five conditions for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. If any one of those conditions is not met, that is a force that the population or the genetics of a population is acted upon that makes it not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So let me just kind of recap what this slide says. It's this thing called Hardy-Weinberg principle, also known as Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, that the genetics of a population is not changing at all from one generation to another. The conditions 
for a population's genetics to not change from one generation to the next, there can be no mutations. And right off the bat, you're like, yeah, that doesn't happen. No, it doesn't. That's why Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is like never happens. But if it did, there could be no mutations. All right, so no mutations. There has to be random mating, okay? So if you had non-random mating, that would mean the conditions of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium would not be true or they're not met. Okay, random mating means there is an equal probability that one individual will mate with another individual no matter what. This most likely, most always is never true because with mating, there is always a preference. So let's take birds for example. If you have a female bird and she is gonna mate, she does not have an equal probability of mating with any male that's around her. She is going to mate with the most brightly colored male. So she has a preference. So therefore, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium can't be met, right? There can be no natural selection. That ain't gonna happen. <laughs> there has to be a, an extremely large population size. Okay, that one can actually be met usually. Extremely large population size. So anytime you have a small population, um, can't, uh, can't be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And then no gene flow. No gene flow means no immigration or immigration. So no, com no, no, um, outsiders coming in and no insiders going out. Okay. No gene flow. All right. These are the conditions for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium to be met. Meaning these are the conditions that must be met for there to not be any change in the genetic frequencies, the, the frequency of different alleles in a population. And these, this means that populations will not evolve. We know that all populations evolve. There is always going to be um, a change in genetic frequency. But remember, this is just kind of like a comparison point to see just how much is a population evolving. So I hope that kind of makes sense. If at least one, only one of those has to not be met and you can say the population is evolving. Okay. This is where things get a little bit tricky and where it kind of becomes a little bit difficult for me to do this through video, but we're going to do the best we can. We're just going to take some notes and then I'm going to follow up in uh, class and we're going to work some problems. All right. So Hardy-Weinberg principle, we have some math problems to do. Yay. First thing I need you to know when we are working Hardy-Weinberg or HW problems, you have a P and you have a Q. All right, cool. These are represent your two alleles. P and Q. I need you to know that P refers to the dominant allele and Q refers to the recessive allele. That just means allele, that one version of a gene from one parent. All right, so P is dominant, Q is recessive. That's the first thing you need to have memorized. Then we have a formula. We're talking about frequency here. And so when you think of frequency, I want you to think of percent, but as the decimal. So you don't multiply by 100. So let's say 50% of the gene pool is P or the dominant allele, then the frequency of P would be 0.5. All right. If the frequency of P is 0.5, so half of the gene full pool is dominant alleles, well, then what's Q? You automatically will know what Q is. So if P is 0.5, 50%, then Q also has to be 0.5, 50%. P plus Q will always equal one. So if you have a problem that says 30% uh, of the gene pool is Q, 30% of the gene pool is recessive alleles. So if you know it's 30%, then Q is 0.3, so then that means P has to be 0.7, all right? So that's the other thing you need to know. And then you can rearrange the formula. One minus P equals Q, one minus Q equals P. Y'all are all in like higher level math, so I'm, I'm assuming everyone's good with that. Okay, the other part of this are the genotypes. P and Q are referring to just dominant allele 
recessive allele by themselves. Now we're looking at genotype because we know that the alleles don't just come by themselves. You get one set from mom, one set from dad, or one set from the mother, one set from the father, and they come together to form one of these three options. So you're either going to get two dominant, one dominant, one recessive, or two recessive. These are the three possible genotypes. So now we need to take into consideration genotypic frequencies. And when we take genotypic frequencies into consideration, it gets a little bit more complicated. This is your formula for that. I'm going to be honest though, you're gonna use this formula more than you use that formula. And then you're gonna use, you're gonna do a lot of square rooting. Because if, you, if they give you Q squared, you take the square root of Q squared, and then you can get Q. And then if you're given Q, you can find P. And then if you can find P, you can find P squared. You're probably like, girl, you lost me. That's okay, we're gonna do some practice. P squared refers to homozygous dominant. 2PQ refers to heterozygous. Q squared refers to homozygous recessive, all right? So if a problem gives you Q squared, the percent of the population that is homozygous recessive is 50%. You know Q squared equals 50% or 0.5. If you took the square root of that, you could get Q, okay? But just, I just want you to have this part memorized at this point by the time then you go to the next class, that P is dominant, Q is recessive, P squared is double homozygous dominant, 2PQ is heterozygous, Q squared is homozygous recessive. I'm going to go ahead and skip over that. We have some strategies for solving Hardy-Weinberg problems. If you're given a genotype, calculate P and Q by adding up the total number of A, big A and little a alleles. If you know the phenotypes, then use little a, little a to find Q squared, then take the square root of that to find Q. Use that to find that formula right there to find the genotype frequencies. And you don't have to have these formulas memorized. They're always given to you. And if P and Q are not constant from generation to generation, then the population is evolving. So these, um, this problem right here is a Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium problem, meaning that the numbers will stay constant from generation to generation as long as all of those conditions are met. We should never have a problem where the numbers are staying constant from generation to generation, but within one generation, we can always find what these letters actually mean. I would like to, I think I'm just going to do the problems in class. Um, I'm going to do the problems in class. Let's go ahead and um, just kind of move on from that for now because this is what a problem would look like. I'm going to start class with this problem next time. Um, and let's just go through the five causes of evolution. Let's just start with the five causes of evolution real quick. Yeah, we have some. Do, do, do. All right, let's just talk about causes for evolution. So what are some of the causes that can make the genotypic frequencies change from one generation to another? First one is mutations. So basically these are just gonna kind of like go against what Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium states. Um, mutations, the rare but uh, very small changes in allele frequencies. Non-random mating. Non-random mating means there's a mate preference. Uh, Non-random mating also means that um, individuals will not mate with those individuals that are closely related to them. They, they're like, mm, no thank you. So there's not an equal likelihood that siblings are going to mate and non-siblings are going to mate. It's, it's not an equal likelihood. So that's non-random mating. It's not random. There is a preference. All right. Um, so there's the minor causes for evolution. The major causes for evolution is going to be Number three is natural selection. Number four is genetic drift. And number five is called gene flow. Okay, so number one, mutations. Number two, non-random mating. Number three, and you can see this on page 243. Just look for number one, number two, number three, number four, and then turn to 244, write down number five. All right, 
So number one, mutations, number two, non-random mating, number three, natural selection, number four, genetic drift, and number five, gene flow. Starting in the next class, I'm going to do Hardy-Weinberg problems with you. And you have some practice problems on page 247 that we're going to go over. Once we are done with Hardy-Weinberg problems, I am going to pick up right here. And I'm going, because I'm not going to talk about mutations and non-random mating, because I just told you what they were. We're going to talk about natural selection. Then we're going to talk about what genetic drift is. Then we're going to talk about gene flow the causes of evolution, and then I'll finish up with um, a few more vocabulary words and talk about sexual selection, and that'll be it for the next, for, for chapter 21, basically. Okay, um, uh, that's about it. That's, that's where I'm going to stop today, and we will work on the rest of us tomorrow. I'll talk to you guys later.